My hair is terrible. Hey, everybody. We are live. This is your girl, Sister Talk with Valerie in a chocolate smoothie. And welcome, everyone, to another hour of Sister Talk with Valerie. Today, first, I want to send out some prayers to my girl, Vina. She has been our consistent and loyal guest, and she is not doing well today. She is um, not feeling well, and please send her some prayers. She's been in the ER all afternoon, but we we know that God is able, and we trust him, and we've been praying her up. As a matter of fact, I got to send a message to the group of ladies to let them know to pray her up some more. Um, as soon as I get off this live, I'm going to be doing that. We were going to have one subject. It was called Beauty for Ashes, but I want Vina to leave that. She really um, kind of, that speaks to her heart. And so tonight's subject, we're kind of going to change things around a little bit. And today as I was in prayer and I was just really spending some time with God, one of the things that came to mind is I heard a minister talk about um, from our heart lies the issue. So everything comes from our heart. And I know that a lot of times we say phrases like God sees my heart. Um, and the minister said that we have to pray in the spirit and not in the flesh, but we are always in the flesh and our minds and our thoughts and how we move. We're usually always in the flesh. So my, what came to mind is, is that what is in our hearts? Like, what is the content of our hearts? And I say that because so many times, myself included, can be in a place of peace and happiness and just like that be come out of that place. Somebody might piss you off, cut you off in the, in, in, on, while you're driving. If you, if you think about the things that happen in this world, sometimes it evokes us to wrath and anger and rage. People can do that to you. Life can do that to you. Situations can do that to you. And so when we're in that state, what is the condition of our heart? Um, I've been attending Truth Ministry, and the pastor had a really good, really good ministry the other day. He talked about that, you know, we, we get all dressed up when we go to church, and we, we, we doing our, we saying the right things. We ain't cussing. We ain't smoking. We ain't doing none of those things. But then as soon as we get in the parking lot, we back to the old selves. And that sometimes as we are praying, God is like, who that is? Like, that ain't who you was a minute ago. That's not who you are. You know what I'm saying? That's not who you are when somebody pisses you off. That ain't who you are when you're talking to your kids. So who are you? So I'm going to pose that question to you, Kia, and answer it any way you want. Because my question is, what is the condition of our hearts? And I, I, I mean down deep, the things that no one else might know, no one else might see. What's going on with our hearts? Well, I first want to say that you look beautiful this evening, darling. <laughs> I'm loving your look. You look fabulous, mother. Um... So I want to Thank you, daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you just lovely, just lovely. Well, in honor of Vina, and we're trusting and believing that she is going to be perfectly fine and just healing and healed and healthy and back with us next week. But in honor of Vina, I want to read some scriptures because Vina has the word in her heart on the tip of her tongue and she's always ready with a definition. So in honor of her, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures that deal with the heart. OK, so um, this first one comes from Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And when you text me this evening, you said you, you, you made this statement flowing from your heart. Um, so for me... Um, I always think about how when we plant things inside of our hearts, 
um, that's where we kind of move, we operate from everything that has been planted in our heart. So if we're, we have to always be mindful of the things that we are meditating on, the things that we're listening to, the things that we are speaking over ourselves, the people that we are around, because those things are kind of being absorbed by our mm-hmm. hearts. And then once the heart is filled with whatever we're filling it with, that is what comes out. That is what comes out. And I'm thinking about Pastor Michael Todd talking about imagination lately. Um, And I think that's also tied to our hearts, what's in us, what, who we are at our core and like how we think on things and how we internalize things um, deals with our hearts. So I think this is a great subject to talk about because um, depending on where you are with your heart, that's how you're going to see everything mm-hmm. around you. And I feel like the reason why it says it'll flow from your heart, because like you were saying, when you're in traffic and your mood changes or you get in a situation and you go from peace to all of a sudden you're upset or angry, I feel like that speaks to what is deep down in your heart. Because what's deep down in your heart is what's going to flow out naturally. Remember they said, well, when people speak, watch what they say, because it's flowing from the abundance. What's in the abundance of the heart is what what flows or overflows from people. So it's like, are you truly at peace? If it could be switched off that quickly, are you truly, um, you know, feeling secure with yourself or feeling um, stable or feeling Mm -hmm. emotionally secure if it could just be set off? in any moment, you know? So I think this is a, this is a awesome topic. I think we tend to mask a lot of things. So, you know, or push them back or think just like we talk about healing and thinking that you're healed, right? You can have good intentions and say, Oh, I feel good today. I'm gonna have a great day. It's gonna be good. Everything's gonna be positive. And then something will happen. It could be as simple as a, you hear a song on the radio. And it takes you back to a place in time. Um, It could be that, you know, your kids just broke your favorite ornament or whatever. Right. And then and then you're instantly in that place. Right. So you said out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right. So I think sometimes we don't even realize that our heart is filled. Right. That our heart is stuffed Mm -hmm. that we really can't take anymore because again, we all, we have a tendency and I have to, I I can only talk about what I know. And I'm going to say about, I always say black and brown people because that's what I am and that's what I know. But black and brown women have a tendency to not feel like they can be tired. They can be down that they don't have the answers. They have to always, we, we are always switching. We're always getting it done. We always, you know, moving and grooving. We always trying to be, you know, I'm, I'm the mama and I'm the I'm the partner and I'm a cook and I'm a clean and I'm a work and I'm a da 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 And if I say I'm tired or I don't feel like it, if this child say one more thing to me, one more thing, or if, if my boss say one more thing to me, all of that is package stuff that we have inside. And I think because we are so, that word resilient, Resiliency is not always a good thing. I heard someone say that and I agree because resiliency means that you can continue to load on, pack on, put on, and you carry in all this load and you think I'm supposed to carry it. It's not supposed to feel heavy or, or, or I'm weak. So I think we have to check our, our heart meter from time to time. And just like we do spring cleaning, sometimes we got to do heart cleaning. What's still there that I'm not dealing with? I might not talk about it. It might not present itself to me all the time. It might be miles away. But if it's still there, something can prick it and it can it can come back up. Yeah, I agree. But I, when you were talking, I was thinking about how, what is the story that we're telling ourselves that we feel like we have to do everything, be everything? Um, like, what is that story? Is it like, if I don't handle it, it will fail or I will fail. Or if I don't keep moving, then I'm going to fall or I'm going to, 
um, succumb to whatever, like what, and a lot of times I think that that is driven that by fear that need to keep going, keep pushing, keep packing everything on is driven by fear, the need to control everything and have everything kind of like moving in a certain flow. And if I'm not moving it and controlling it and, and managing it on my own, then in some way I'm failing or uh, in some way I'm just kind of, um, immobilized by fear. So, um, what is that story that we're telling ourselves um, about? Well, I think I think it's not just the story that we're telling ourselves. I think it's the story that we inherit in some points. Mm -hmm. You you might see your mom, your dad, somebody in your family, always grinding and always looking. It looks like that's what you're supposed to do, and somehow that's what you carry into your adulthood. Or you might see the opposite. You know, you might come from a place where we ain't never had nothing. We had to struggle for every crumb of bread. So I'm on my grind. I'm never going to have that happen to me again. You know, that's fear. I'm never going to have that happen to me again. So, or, you know, I was raised in with an abusive person or an alcoholic person or a person. They don't have to be so necessarily traumatic, but maybe someone that was a perfectionist and they needed everything to be done correctly all the time. I'm either I'm that's what I'm that's my goal and drive or I'm not going to do that to my kids. I'm just be really laid back about everything. So I think some of it is inherited that 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 narrative that we saw sometimes, not necessarily and what maybe what we tell ourselves is this is what it's supposed to look like. Maybe we tell ourselves I'm a failure if I'm not achieving X, Y, and Z. Maybe we tell ourselves that I'm not as good as or something is lacking in me. I hear people say to me all the time, friends and family, well, I just feel like I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to have that. And my question is always, who said that? Like, who told you that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, that makes me think of having to uproot some things that are deep in our hearts, uprooting those things and giving our permission, ourselves permission to tell a different truth. And that's why I think that this series that um, we've been kind of talking about with Michael Todd is so powerful because it's like, how do you imagine yourself being like, can you imagine a different way of being? Can you imagine a different story? Like, I'm not going to get that done and it's okay. Or um, if I fail at something or I face this adversity, how am I going to face this adversity and how am I going to look at it? Is it, will it be an opportunity for something else or will it be something that hinders me and shuts me down? So it's like changing the way that we view our challenges in life and the way we view what we're, we're free to do. You know what I mean? Like, um, I was thinking to myself today, um, cause I working in the capacity that I work in now, I remember being, for example, I work with teachers, but I remember being a teacher and feeling very desperately in need of help of assistance to be more effective in the classroom. And I would, I would just say, I would really love for someone to just come and be able to help me. <laughs> in this situation. And, and there's many other, I can, I'm using my career as a reference, but there are many other examples in my life that I could use. But anyway, I say that to say, now God has placed me in a position to be that resource that I desperately wanted at one time. And it made me think about how sometimes when we're going through things, we think this is terrible. This is the worst. I need this. I need that. And it's like, God will use those moments where you feel like you're at your wit's end to move you into purpose so that you would be the resource that you're desperately in need of at this moment. You know what I mean? And so it's like- I like that so that you would be the resource that you need. Right, right, right. Whether it's being a resource for yourself or being a resource for other people, it just made me think of being in the position that I am right now. Like there was a time where I was full of fear and anxiety and just just scared about my performance in the career world and as being a teacher because it was just so much. And I just wanted to have a person who could come and be a resource and really help me. And um, now I'm able to do that, but I'm able to do that from a different capacity because I have felt 
what some teachers are feeling. And so my my commitment to them looks different. My willingness to go the extra mile looks different. And I feel like sometimes our hearts are packed on with all these things and we're so in des we're in desperation for many things. And it's like, it'll get better. And not only will you move out of the place that you're in, but you'll move out of the place you're in to become a resource for not only yourself, but a resource for other people. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like, it's like testimony. You can't have a yeah. testimony without a test, right? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it might not feel like it because sometimes right. the place that you're in. So we're talking about the abundance of the heart, right? And I have to say, I have, I'm their kid. It is not, you know, there were years when I thought that some of the things that I went through was because Maybe I wasn't able to go through things on my own. I wanted somebody to be there. Some of the things I went through was because of fear. But God has shown me, and I've proven to myself, I'm good on my own. I can take care of myself. I I, I, I do it every day. And it's not like I, I sit back and go, oh, my God, I don't know how am I going to do this. It just happens. And I'm good with it. I'm good with my peace. But that need for something else, like somebody to just not even to do for you, but somebody that can be your resting place. Like, wow, I talked earlier about sometimes I think that African-American women and probably African-American men, too. I can only speak to what I know, my gender. We, we, we overdo because we think we have to. And we don't have some of us do and some of us don't have that soft place where we can just be vulnerable. And sometimes it's to our detriment because we have some females that are always on, always, I don't need you. I got my bag, da 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 And I'm not saying that that is a bad thing to be confident in that way, but I think part of that could be because that fear of being vulnerable, always looking like we got it. I don't need X, Y, and Z, whether it be a man or whatever, right? We all need, I mean, we're human. There are things we need. We might've been disappointed at times and we don't want to have expectations because we don't want to be disappointed. We might, you know, feel like, well, ain't nobody going to come to my rescue. So if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. But that does not negate those feelings of wanting that soft place. Those feelings of wishing that there was a strength that didn't take care of it for you, but helped you to kind of take that extra breath. So even if you had to go back out to your grind the next 15 minutes, you could have that exhale moment. You know, somebody says, it's okay, babe, da, 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 that, that kind of thing. And I feel like, nah, I ain't got nobody. So let me just, you know, suck it in, sniffle, and keep it moving. That's a good point. And that's kind of what, I guess you helped me to come like full circle with what I was thinking. Like um, it's important for us to be that resource for one another. Like we've been in a position of weakness and feeling overwhelmed where our hearts were just filled with so much. And as we move out of that, or when we're moving away from a space where we feel good enough to do it, it's important for us to be that resource for one another, but also for us to realize moments where we need to just be vulnerable. And then when we see one another being vulnerable to like be aware of that, to see one another, like I was saying a couple weeks ago, like really seeing someone in their vulnerability and, and being that safe space, being that mm -hmm. protection for them. And I think that, we all can kind of provide that for one another in some way. And it doesn't have to be in grand gestures or money or anything. It could be like, hey, girl, you know, I, how are you doing? I'm just checking on you. You know what I mean? Or, um, hey, how, how's it been? How's it going? Because we know how it feels when we're in our deep, dark places where we're like, ain't nobody calling me. Ain't nobody checking on me. Nobody yeah, cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like being that for someone else for a moment. And then sometimes people can fill you up with things that you didn't even know you needed at that moment when you're able to like reach out and be a resource. Um, for example, Miss Terry called or texted me when I was taking the first day I took my son to college. And she was just like, I just want to let you know I'm thinking about you and congratulations and it filled my heart because as a single mom, 
I start and right before I got the text too, I just started feeling like, man, I, sh I don't feel like I should be doing this by myself. Like I want, I want somebody to be here with me to see Aww. this event happen. You, you, know? Your mama? you know, I would have came. I know, I know, but you know, I would have came. But I'm it's just on my hair. <laughs> You're going the wrong way. It's the camera. I, I get confused with this. Uh, <laughs> with this. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean I digress. Right. Me and my it's hair. The new <laughs> hair. But um, no, I was just feeling like, man, I want to experience this moment with someone. This is monumentous. And there's been so many moments in my parenthood that I have felt like I was doing big events by myself. Um, and that's not to throw shade on anybody. It's just what it has been. So when I was taking him to school, I was like, oh, I'm so proud of my son and I'm so emotional and overwhelmed. And this is my baby and I'm about to leave him here on campus. And he's becoming a young man. And she texted me. She was like, hey, I just want you to know. And I was like, thank you. Like, I just appreciated God. that she thought of me on that day and that she, you know, she's a mom. She's had to let her babies go and she knows what it's like. And so, and in that moment, she might have felt some weakness in her heart or felt overwhelmed. And in remembering that she's able to be a resource to someone else. Like I, I know what that feels like. I've been through that. And now I'm at a point where I can be a resource to you. I can fill your heart up with something different than what you're feeling in the moment. I can overflow into you um, this healing or this experience that I've had. And now you can fill your heart with something else. And it's not just ooh, anxiety, fear, sadness. It's like hope for better days to come. I've been through this too. It's going to be all right. Like I've seen a different day. I've been in that place and now this is where I am. So it's like, that is what we can be for one another. You know, if you think about all the things that you've experienced, and I think sometimes we get in a certain place and we forget where God has brought us from. And it's like, don't forget those things because in those moments you can gain so much strength and you could be a, a resource for someone else. Like if you really just think on, you know, I really used to struggle with this. Or I really didn't have this. Or I really was desperate for this advice. And now I'm here and it's not like, okay, let me just keep grinding and, and get to the next level or make the next accomplishment. But it's like, okay, let me reflect and realize what I've grown through. And then also see how I can be a resource to someone but, else. But that takes introspective thinking, Kia, right? Mm -hmm. So Miss Terry, she has that kind of heart. I don't know. God blessed her with some overflow of love. And I know that it's because Terry's grandma was really loving, like she she has she comes from a very loving family and so it, it's almost like second nature to her to think about other people almost i tell all the time to the detriment of herself because i think she gives so much you know she gives so much but that's who she is but in order to get to that place where you're thinking about um giving back to people and i think that we should all be there that's that's what i aspire to do i try to be encouraging and when when my when I'm when I have the opportunity and someone reaches out to me, whether they be family or friend or even foe, that I'm giving them something, some kind of wisdom. But when you to get to that place, you have to be introspective. And we are such a society, not all of us, I hate when you know it sounds like I'm making a generalized statement, but we are a society that is about us. And really more and more it feels like society pushes us to be about us. Even this whole COVID thing and now people are more isolated. People are thinking more about themselves. Now, not that it's a bad thing to think about yourself, but almost to a place of selfishness. I don't know if we're getting better at that. Let me think about somebody else besides me place. I don't know if we're getting better at that because people that, you know, there was a young lady on um, the news the other day who used to work for Facebook and she was talking about how Facebook is creating this culture of anguish and, you know, conflict and making people enraged so that they can continue to have clicks, right? And I think it's not a far jump to do that because I think people are really 
a lot of people are on edge. Yes, there are good people in the world, but there are a lot of people on edge. And it's just like that one thing, do it. Come on, one more thing, and I'm gonna be here, you know. So when we so that that speaks again to the question of what is the condition of your heart? Because mm -hmm. if you are a believer in God and God sees our hearts. When we're praying, he's not really listening. It's not that he's not listening, but it's more important to him what what the the pureness and the sincerity of what we're saying than the words that are coming out of our mouth, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like the Bible says, the devil know the Bible back and forward. So we could we could stand before him and go, oh God, you know what? You know my heart. I know I'm sitting up here sleeping with you know old girl's husband, but you know my heart. Yup, I just bust so and so in the head, but you know my heart, and they made me do it. Like, well, I need this money because I got to take care of my kids. And you know my heart. Like, we make excuses, but we have to recognize that when God is looking at us, he truly is seeing into our heart. So all of those excuses, all of those things that we're saying to justify the condition of our heart, it's almost like, you know, looking at a cesspool of dirt and grime and sewerage, right? Because... I don't care what I've discovered about myself included in this world is that we do have some wicked hearts and minds. There are thoughts that come to my mind. I could be skipping to do that down the street and I know I ain't by myself. And I, a thought will come to my mind that is so like, oh my God, what's from, well, where that come from? Why would you even think such a thing? But that's, mm -hmm. that's what happens to us sometimes. So if those things can come to our mindset that they have to be somewhere in us, and they have to be part of the cesspool that our heart looks like. And so, you know, even when you, when you think about what the Bible says about how Jesus came to take on the sins of the world, that it was so ugly that almighty God had to turn his face away. He couldn't even, I could, he couldn't even look at nothing that was so filthy. That mm -hmm. said something, this is God who created us and know all about us. He couldn't even look at his son because of our stuff. So we know we got some stuff. So when we are examining the 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 sort of nature and the and the vibe and the beat of our heart, I'm not saying that we should beat up on ourselves and go, oh, "You just a terrible person. You worst person in the world." I'm saying that what it could do is to help us to reflect about why we have certain behaviors. Like it could give us an opportunity to think about things a little further, right? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, give you this example, and then I'm gonna hear your feedback. I was I was I had to meet um, my co colleague at, at my new job the other morning, right? And as I was turning off of Broad Street onto somewhere named Grace, this woman, I was at a red light, and this woman walked past, right? She was walking so slow, almost like a turtle. She had a mattress strapped to her front. A blanket strap, not even a mattress, like a small padding, a thick padding strapped to her front, um, a blanket strapped to her back. She had about three or four bags, and then she had a duffel bag. She was like, I, you ever seen somebody that you know that if you scrub their skin, they would be three shades lighter? She was dusty, and she was walking so slow across the street, right? And I looked into her eyes and I was like, oh my God. I started praying for her. I was like, God, she's so tired. She is so tired. Now, after I said that, I said, Lord, I said, you know, I prayed for her. I said, give her what she needs. Give her housing, da, 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 right? And I pulled off because I was late for my meeting. But that thing bothered me because that happened yesterday and all night. And even this morning, my thought was, and in my prayer, and it could have been God speaks to me, you should have stopped. I don't care what meeting you were. You should have stopped and said, hey, you know, I see you, like you'd be talking about. I see you. What can I do for you? You all right? And, it, it, you know, people sometimes see people that are homeless, and automatically they, they create this judgment. Oh, they're this, they that, they that. And they might be sometimes, but you don't know, because you don't live outside, right? So whatever it is, right? So... But we, we make a judgment. And I thought, that, you know, that could be us. There is nothing that says that couldn't be us. And sometimes people just want to be acknowledged. They don't want nothing for you. They, they just want you to say hi. And that bothered me that I did not turn that car around and just approach her until I loved her. That bothered me. 
Mm -hmm. I feel like that was a missed opportunity, but it won't be another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. I think we miss opportunities like that all the time um, to show up for one another, obviously, because look at where we are right now in the world, but we are the world. <laughs> we are the world. That sounds so cheesy, but we are the world, you know? That's so true. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, so the experiences that we're having around us or that we see and the things that we complain about, it's kind of like, well, what are you doing? Instead of pointing fingers, like how can you contribute to solutions or what can you do to keep keep moving in the right direction or to keep things, to do something kind. And you know what? I had what that same experience. Yeah. Like I had that same experience. And it could be something like, hey, God bless you. I see you, you know, praying for you. Here's a couple of dollars that might be, you know, a coffee for us. That would mean a lot to someone else. But um, I had that experience today too. Um, where there was a woman who was walking from her car and she she's an older woman. And then where I live, if you ain't got like a cart or a buggy to <laughs> unload your car, you got to walk. You got a long walk from your, from your car to the, from the garage to your door. And, you know, when I have to get my bags, I, I, I got to the point where I got myself a little beach cart so I can stroll things in. There was this older woman who had bags in both hands and I had just driven from work and I was on the road for an hour because I got a long commute. So I was sitting in my car, leaned back and something said, go help her. Go offer to carry her bag. You know what I mean? Go offer to help her carry her bags. But then I was like, that's weird. What does she think I'm trying to rob her? Or no, I don't think she got it. And all that talking I was doing myself, <laughs> she was already at the door. Go carry the bags. She's like, you still trying to... But we like, do that. We, we yeah. find excuses. And I'm like, I could have just immediately, regardless of what was going on, because I could have came back and got my stuff, um, immediately jumped up and went and just helped her. You know what I mean? And and it's like, I'm going to be that older woman. And what am I going to say about the young people around me that may not jump to help? And back in the day, it was almost like expected, like, go help, you know? Um, and so I'm like, dang, that's a missed opportunity. And then who knows what nugget she could have given me or perspective or whatever that could have happened in that exchange that I could have passed down to my daughters and they could have passed down to their daughters. So it's so, it, it's so much, so much more far reaching than whatever I'm feeling in that moment, because God has attached to the things he asks us to do purpose and opportunity and blessings. And it's always bigger than you in that moment. And it's far reaching to everyone around you. And it might be even far reaching to people you don't know or generations to come. So it's but always you said something key, right? Yeah. But we do have to be um, wise, you know, um, God says use mm -hmm. wisdom, but you right. said specifically that God had said something said, that's what you said. Something said, I don't believe it was something. I believe it was God. That's the same thing with me. There was a reason why my car stopped at that moment that that was the woman that walked across the street. I think we're presented with a lot of opportunities every day, all mm -hmm. throughout the day to do something out outside of ourselves for someone. It could be a smile. We might not recognize that it. it could be the person that we're working with that's getting on our last nerve and something inside of us might say, you know what, stop, stop, don't go to 10, you know, say something nice to them. Or we walk in the store and we walk past somebody and we give them a mean mug. We miss opportunities all the time, I think, because mm -hmm. number one, we can be self-centered or we're so busy thinking about what's going on, our, oh, I need to do this. I mean, cause I do that. Okay, what do I need to get out of the store? You know, how much money do I need? How much do I have? What do my bank account? You know, all of those things. But it, mm -hmm. it, is, it is so easily takes us away from other people and it makes us self-centered in a lot of ways. So even if it's a smile, we could change a life with a smile. Mm -hmm. Remember that movie we watched, Kia? What was that called? That movie. Oh, Crazy Guy? 
Yes. <laughs> oh, that that's a good movie. Say crazy. Well, the guy that um was ran into the back of the lady or something happened where she was. He ran into, well, he was he was a little he was crazy at, at first, but she made it worse because of road rage and she said something nasty to him and he just went in. That was yeah. Was I yeah. think it was called road rage or something like that. I don't remember, but it was good. It was very good. And it gave the point. And I think about that <laughs> when I'm in traffic. I'm like, look. Cause it's so true. Like, like my girls, they're little. So, and I'm not the best driver in the world. So when, <laughs> when I'm driving, usually people in back of me are like, you know, move out hey. the way, old lady. Stop going. Yeah, they, oh my god, mom! They be giving me the finger. They be beeping at me. And so my girls sit in the back seat, and they always be like. Mommy, this is what my nine-year-old said. Every time someone gives you that mean look, I just look at them like. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something, girl. I remember either no, I was following you, or you was following me. I'm having hair issues, but Kia, because you know your mama drive. Like I got to get where I got to get. Even if I'm not speeding, I was like, you know, when you was driving the truck, I was like, okay. Have some patience. That's your child. You love her. It's going to take you forever to get where you're going. So I was like, yeah, I'm coming, mom. And you're just like, dee, 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 dee. come on. At least do 30, kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do, we were in D.C. I hate driving in D.C. I And them people, they, got, they have no patience for me. Like, go back wherever you come from. So we were driving there, and this lady got mad. She pulled around me, and she was, like, speeding. And she, I think she gave me the finger. And the girls were in the back seat, like, oh, and they were mad. And they were like, Mommy, honk your horn at her. Drive up faster. Oh, y'all, yeah, my, like, my, my, on um, Maryland family, y'all such thugs. Honk your horn. <laughs> That's what the kids in the back were saying. Fuck your horn, <laughs> yeah. But my point to them was, um, I was like, you know what? I don't. I, I I'm at fault probably because I the way I drive. But also, what would that do? What would that prove if I did that? And you never know what mind space people are in. They're carrying weapons, like they're like you said, they're on a short fuse. And so my reaction has to be different, not only for myself, but I don't want my daughters to think, oh, somebody stick their middle finger at me. Look, this is how you get them back. And in a moment of rage, I could teach them a lesson about how you interact with people that could cost them their lives one day. So I, I'm like, you know what? No, that's not how you react. I'm not going to flip her off. I'm not going to speed up on her. I'm not going to speed up. I'm going to drive this pace because I actually be driving the speed limit. People get mad at me for driving the speed limit. I am driving the speed limit. <laughs> but anyhow, I, you know, but it's just a testament to here are my two daughters in the back seat. What are they seeing? What, if, what am I communicating to them about a message? It's like, even my daughter said to me, Mommy, I know you're going to go off on those teachers. If da, 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 da. And I'm like, no, I don't go off on the teachers. I advocate for my children because that's my job. So it's like always thinking about not only what I'm doing, but what is communicating to them about how they should conduct themselves as young ladies. And... If, if your heart has an abundance of bitterness, of hatred, of anything, and you have children, that's a dangerous combination because you never know how they're interpreting your actions or how they're learning lessons from what you do. And you might be wholeheartedly feeling justified in how you mm -hmm. feel about your reaction but your reaction is communicating something to them about how they should conduct themselves in situations. And you know so what that says to me? That says to me that the abundance of your heart is, the core of it is love. The abundance of your heart, the core is intention and being a, a, a good mom and how your children see you. Every All of us, we don't have that. 
I can't sit here and tell you that even in raising you and your sister that I always came to mind, well, what am I conveying to my children? And I, and I know that there's a consequence to that. Even when I was in very toxic relationships, I know that you guys saw that. And I know that it impacts you now, even in the choices that you make, even in what you feel about relationships. And and while I can't take that back, one of the things that I'm so aware of now, mm -hmm. at, even as I'm watching y'all raise your children, is the fact that you don't get too many chances to make a second impression with children. And, you know, when I, and as I was growing up, it was all about what I say. What my parents said is what it was. Don't do as I do, do as I say was one of the phrases. You know, I'm grown and you a child, stay in this child's place was another phrase. But I saw a lot, not necessarily even just my immediate, you know, my mom and dad, but my aunts and uncles, you know, there was violence. Like, I, there was always a fight. I, I say, I tell this story all the time, how I sat, we had a red stool and a red velvet chair that my mother had plastic slip covers over that I can look at right now. And I used to sit in that chair and watch men beat the shit out of my hunts. Like I'd be sitting there like I'm watching a movie. And my mom too. I remember one time my mom tried to call the police on my stepfather and he snatched, we had the old time phones that sat on the wall. It was yellow with a long little scrolly thing. He snatched the whole phone up off the wall. And I was like, wow. And I remember that we used to be so tight, me and my stepfather, right? We was tight. But because I saw at the end of their relationship, that violence between him and my mom, I used to call him daddy. He was daddy. I, I have, he wasn't my biological father, but he was my daddy because he raised me. But I remember the day we were outside and they were having this argument in the street. My aunt had came to pick her up. We was, she, he was trying to get me in the car and my cousins in the car and he was coming behind her and I was behind her. And I turned around and I said, I hate you. That's why you ain't my daddy. And I, you ain't never going to be my daddy again. And although, you know, we we grew in our relationship strengthened and him and my mom ended up separating and I loved them to the day that he passed away. I never called him daddy again after that day, though, because as close as we were and how much I loved him, something in my heart broke that day. And because I had seen this violent, conflicting relationships between men and women as I was trying to navigate my relationships, it was just a part of it because it wasn't different, you know? And so, you know, I, I don't know nothing. People can have conversations with me now about their little picket fence, mom, dad never argued. I don't know nothing about that. So when you come from that, it's difficult to try to navigate relationships because I would always say, I'm not going to take nobody putting their hands on me, right? And that happened too, but I got all this mouth. So I will attack verbally. And that's my history because I don't claim that no more. And that's just as de detrimental as physical attacking, right? Because that was such a part of my environment and what I saw. So again, when, when we're examining, when we are examining the abundance of our hearts, we got to go way back because there's a lot of stuff that we don't deal with. It's in there and it comes out. And I can be the people see me as this charismatic person that's always smiling. You can see me that all day long, but you don't know what's going on in my heart. You know, the the we got such baggage, some of us that we carry around that it's like fossils in our heart because it's been there so long that it's just hard and rot. You know, we just take it with us everywhere we go. You know what I'm saying? This is real. And but when that, when that sore spot is pricked and we react. You know, it could be you stepped on my foot and I'm ready to go in on you. It ain't even about the fact that you stepped on my foot. You stepped on my foot. You look like my dad when you did it. And you smell like my aunt. And I hate them. You know what I'm saying? All of that at one time. So we just got to know um, that. The, and the other thing, and I'm going to say it again, is that if God sees our heart, what does that look like to him? What does that look like? I, Somebody told me that God doesn't see us. He sees Jesus when he looks at us. And I and I, and I thank God if that's the case, because our hearts, our hearts need some surgery, some of us. Man, that was powerful. That was so many thoughts that I had thinking when you were talking. 
Um, but woo, when you said we have fossils, I just imagine like some decrepit, just old, deep down buried stuff. But I don't know. I feel like everything can be unearthed. You know what I mean? Everything can be unearthed. And I feel like um, with some digging, sometimes people don't want to do the digging to discover like what's what's in there, what's underneath. Mm -hmm. But it's such I feel like there's freedom on the other side of doing that kind of work. And people always say and I always and I ask you this question, get whole, get healed, unearth those things. And it, they sound like really good buzzwords, but. I guess my thinking is I feel like people want to know how do you even begin to do that type of thing? How do you begin to to face some of those things? And it, it seems very scary like to think I'm going to have to touch this artifact. I'm going to have to touch this wound or this fossil and hold it in my hand. Like I don't even want to look at it. I don't even want to think about it. But I feel like what has happened when we decide that we're not going to do that is that it forever just puts a smudge mark on everything we touch. Like it's, it's in our fingerprints. It, the dirt is in between our fingers. And it's like, as we go around touching things, we're leaving these, these marks, these smudges behind. And it's like, don't you want to be clean from that? Like rid of that. You know what I mean? Like I want to be rid of that. I don't want to put, none of that on anything I love. I don't want to leave those marks on my children. I don't want to leave it on my husband to be. I don't want to leave that on my family members or the children I face every day and teach. And it's like, if I don't deal with it, then the prints that I'm leaving all around the world are tainted with my hurt. And the things that I love don't deserve that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I want, I'm ready. I'm ready to heal. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like quite, but I feel like conversations like these, um, being honest with myself, really looking at myself and how, how am I in relationships, not just with uh, male and female, but with all relationships. How, how am I in the relationship and is my heart open to the inheritance that God has given me or, or is it bogged down with, with other things that I have cluttering um, how he sees Lunch. me. Yes. I mean, oh, Terry, speaking of Terry, we were just talking about Terry. Miss Terry, you was telling a story about Miss Terry. Um, hey, Terry. And hey, Suleiman. So, yeah. And, and as you talk about, when we talk about those fossils, those hard, dusty places in us that are just so decrepit that they're rotted in us and they're there, right? It's nasty. That's how it sounds. But that's the same scenario with saying you don't put old wine in new wine skins, right? Because old wine has a stench to it. You know, you can smell an old wine a mile away, right? So old wine stinks. So you don't want to put that stinky smell into a fresh new wine skin, you know, smelling like leather and new money, right? But that's what we do. We and and we have the nerve to say, like those of us who are are looking for the other person, right? Because imagine with, with two people, you would have described in the smudge, putting your fingerprints on things you love from all the smudges of your hurt and pain in the past. So now you got your dirt and smudges and your partner's dirt and smudges. Now everything you touch is extra dirt and smudgy. And I don't care how much you try to dust it off by trying to act like, well, our love is going to make all of that go away. It's just like the old wine. It still smells. It still stinks. It's cute. It's just mm -hmm. like taking a bath, not taking a bath for a month and putting on brand new clothes, right? You stink underneath there. And mm -hmm. you going after a while, the, the smell is going to be so bad that nobody's going to be able to be around you because your mm -hmm. stench is so bad. And when our heart is so dirty and unclean, after a while, don't nobody want to be around us because the stench is so powerful and bad. And then we get in our feelings and we're like, oh, don't nobody like me and they don't treat me right. And they said this about me. What about you stink? You know, your 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 heart stinks. <laughs> you are stinking. <laughs> yeah. You stink. you stink. Like, you stink. I mean, you know. <laughs> 
But that, but that's so true. And when you were talking, I was just thinking about the scriptures that said, you know, being um, transformed by the renewing of your mind and how Jesus came to cleanse us and to heal us and to create new creatures in us. And, you know, it's like embracing that, like opening your eyes, opening the eyes of your heart to the inheritance that you have in God, to the greatness that he has for you. And then Pastor Todd said this um, in his last sermon, like, I don't ever want to not be able to imagine the goodness that God has for my life. Like, I don't ever want it to be like, oh, I can't imagine that. You know, and I, it's so crazy because when I was listening to his sermons, I've been thinking about journals that I've been writing that I did write to my spouse at one time. In one of the journals, I said, I cannot, Im I started out with saying, I cannot even imagine. And it was some things that just was like hindering the thought or the hope for having a future that looks different and not saying my present is bad, but I do have a hope for the future. And and it's like, but me saying, I was like, dang, I just said, I cannot even imagine. Like you have to be able to imagine something new, something different, seeing yourself in a different place. And it's like, you might not even be able to think of how you would get to that new place. Or you might think I'm too old to get to that new place, or I've experienced too much, or it's too late for me, but it's never not that. Every, every time you wake up in the morning, you fill up your lungs with breath and air, you have an ability, if you're in your right mind, to imagine a newness, to be transformed. And a part of that I know is when you are trying to uproot some things in your heart, it's like planting seeds of the word, planting the word of God in your heart. And that will, you start to plant out those things and your soil will become different and think different things will grow like the same um, experiences you had. You don't react to them the same way. Like I remember when I was going on a walk with God and I knew I was different because my ex-husband says something to me and I used to allow him to trigger the mess out of me. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let me tell. But my reaction was totally different. It was like, OK, that's OK. Like, that's fine. And I was like, Lord, like, it's real. It's true. You can actually transform me from the inside out, as I plant the word in my heart, as I, as I seek out to be intentional about purifying myself, that purification helps me to get closer to you. As I put more word in, in me, as I purify myself, like I am actually changing. So the abundance of my heart is overflowing. And what comes out of it is I'm not quick to anger. I'm not cussing you out. I'm not doing any of that stuff because I've changed. Now I'm not in any way, shape or form where I would want to be or where I feel like God would want me to be. But I understand from going on a journey, what is possible, what is possible. It's, it's possible to unearth hurt and pain. It's possible to plant new things in you. It's possible to then become a new creature, a renewed creature with a new mindset, with a new imagination about what's possible in your life. Like that, I saw that I've seen it and it has happened. You know what I mean? So it's like just reminding myself of that. It's like continue on that journey, continue planning that in your heart, continue trying to be intentional and living upright as much as possible each day. And watch how you change slowly. And um, and, and I want to say for people, because, you know, when we talk about, you said you made reference to putting the word in your heart and how that changes your, your soul, it changes your heart, it changes your thinking. So when we talk about putting the word in your heart, for me, right, and anybody can disagree with me, I'm not a Bible scholar. It's not so much about, oh, you need to be religious and you need to know the Bible. The Bible is simplistic. It talks about love. It talks about there's a greater person in me than all this negativity in the world. When they say put the word, it's everyday thoughts. It's just, I can do anything. I can do all things because I have God behind me. I, you know, I have faith. I believe. Faith and belief is 
the same thing. It's not like we're saying, oh, you need to be in the church and you need to be. I, I'm not even relating this this type of love, this type of relationship with God has nothing to do with religion. And a lot of times when you talk about religion, people feel like they need to assume size. OK, are you Christian? Are you Baptist? Are you Muslim? What are you this, this and this? And because they want to assume something about your belief or what what the stereotype is about your belief. And so I say to people, I don't debate with anybody my relationship with God because it's just that. I'm, I can't tell you, you could chapter and verse, this says this and or, and this is the, the Bible part that it's in. You know, I, I don't have a good memory. I forget stuff now worse than I always did. But if you start a... a um, a Bible verse, I can finish it because it was enrooted in me from when I was a child. And it's not rocket science. It's stuff I need. I need to know that there is a God that is above it all, that has my back, that no matter what happens in my life, not that nothing's going to happen because that's not what the relationship says, right? It's like your relationship with my children. I love my children. I would want to protect them from anything and everything that would ever happen to them, but that's not feasible. They're going to go through some stuff. As a matter of fact, they need to go through some stuff, right? But I love them. I got their back. I'm always going to be here. I'm not going to agree with a lot of stuff they do and haven't agreed with a lot of stuff. I would do it this way, but they're not me. But I'm going to cover them. All the things that my God and my relationship does for me on a thousand million is what a parent does for their children. So it's not unrealistic that you can be in a place where you could be right now sitting somewhere having sex with two men and one of them make you whatever, whatever. You could be in a crack house. You could be on the street. You could be the worst, whatever, whatever, whatever you can say or imagine or think that you've done that you have had happen to you. There is a God that already know all that and still Still got your back. You can't say that about man because we're, we're human. We're have to fail you. But when you got that kind of back, and th again, that's the kind of back that, that my children and I have. They could be 99 years old. Kids 40. But let's to ask her, her and Talia, let, let me think somebody done did something to my children. I don't care who you are. She can tell you her mama don't went toe to toe with any. Her and Talia, man, you went, you what? Oh my gosh, because that came from me. So that's how God does with us. Imagine our 10 and God's 10. Oh my goodness. That's all I'm going to say. You are mute, babe. Oh no, I said, I can't imagine this because I haven't experienced it, but I know some people haven't had a parent who would, who would do that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's easy for me to imagine who God is to me because of the fierce love that you have had for me in human form. And God says, you know, y'all parents and want to love your kids. Think about how much more I want to love y'all. You know, you, you do, you want good things. You do good things for your children. You want the best for them. Think about how much more as your creator, I want to do for you. So I think it is hard to imagine that type of love, but what I love about God is that when you seek him, like ask, seek, and you will find, like draw closer to him, he's going to draw closer to you. So even if you can't really imagine what, what that would look like in human form or parental form in your everyday life, um, ask and seek and you will find. Try him. Trust and see. Just try him out. Mm -hmm. Try him out. Um, but I love what you said about like, it's not about religion. And I think that what we've seen with the pandemic is a testament of your faith carrying you through, even when you can't go into church doors, because people have had to be creative about how they continue and maintain that relationship with God outside of the traditions and the religiosity of going to church every Sunday, because it looked very different. And going to church online or, you know, whatever that was like was just totally different. So it's like, how do I continue to feed my faith? How do I continue to cultivate this relationship with God? And now it's just about these four walls and him and I 
which really what it is comes down to, um, you know, Jesus wasn't a Christian. He, <laughs> he was, you know, what I mean? again, because I don't think people know that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we fight so, life, but he never said I'm a Christian. That's right, or you have to be a Christian in order to get into heaven. That's not <laughs> that's not what he said. That's not what he was about. That's why I really think I need to do a movie about what my imagination is. Yes, who Jesus was because I just feel like, and I've said this before, he was just someone that you would meet and love. Like just, and I know this person. I get you know what the closest person I could see in human form. Who just has a pure heart and loves on everybody is my dad. He's like that. Oh my he god! <laughs> <laughs> I know he oh. got some. Stuff. I know he got some stuff with him. But what I experienced and have seen about who he is and how he moves, <laughs> as far as when he's showing his love. No, you're right. That's that's your daddy. That's true. I that's don't be crying on my darn. <laughs> No, but um, no, seriously, I know somebody's like, dang, I was gonna date her, but she thinks her father's Jesus. Ain't no way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't measure up. But listen, I like now, now I think, and we probably we, we only have a couple of minutes and we can talk about this later. What is what is your perception of what Jesus would look like today? And I remember on on one of the shows, you you um compared Jesus to Tupac. Now Tup Tupac was a scholar. And Tupac was, you know, he he had some sweat. He had a lot of swag about him. But, you know, he had some thug. He was thug life all day long. So do you think that Jesus went all the way to the left? Was he a thug? Because, you know, I, I think he would be more common than Tupac, you know? <laughs> I don't even think that Tupac was a thug in the sense of what they see as thug. I think that Tupac was kind of... He was carved out of what society, he, he had a metacognition about who he was created to be in society and pushed up against that, that image. You know what I mean? And that's who Jesus was too. Like, I feel like, I don't think Jesus was a thug, but you are not going to be someone who's faint of heart, who's traveling in a desert with sandals on from city to city. And there's droves of people who are hungry around you. What does that sound like? And yes, you hanging out like with people, so and you hanging out with people that Pharisees are like, oh, why are you doing hanging? So you hanging exactly. out with what? you hanging That's out with them. Jesus is like a dude walking through, walking from Chicago inner city to New York inner city to Baltimore inner, like those places where he was going to where it was in the thick of it and people were had sickness and disease because they were poor, no jobs because they were poor, prostituting their bodies because that's how they were able to maintain their livelihood and feed their children. And uh, crippled blind, you think of the veterans rolling around in wheelchairs, you think of prostitution on the, the strip. Like Jesus was that dude walking from these major inner cities, trying to help people, trying to feed people, trying to spread a message of love, letting them know you are not less than, you are valuable. Your situation does not determine that who you are and you were created as a valuable, worthwhile being. And I am going to love you regardless of what the government is saying, I'm going to love you regardless of what other people, how they look down on you or how much money you have. You don't have to have a certain level of intelligence. You don't have to have a certain level of money to get this love. Come get it. I am the son. I call myself the son and you are the son too. You know what I mean? Like, Go ahead, daughter. You better appreciate that. I just, man, when I so think about what on that level, was, you like, right. Jesus was a thug. He had to be a thug. <laughs> He had to be a thug. He, was he wasn't a thug. thug. He was just to, real. To shine down to New York. With, what you doing, bro? Real. I mean, you had to have a bravery to do that. And not everybody was feeling them. Some people was cussing them out and like, who are you? Like the lady, the woman at the well wasn't like, yeah. she was like, why are you all in my business? Yeah, I didn't have <laughs> And 
She, and he was and he was like gutter with her. I know he's not your husband. The one you live with ain't your husband either. Like he was real. He was real. I cannot stand when people try to paint this cookie cutter version of Jesus and make it seem like he was just this weak lamp. You cannot be weak telling people about their stuff to their face. You can't be weak doing that. And you can't be a person who is afraid when you're choosing to travel with people who are outcasted by society and love it and saying, I'm going to love you anyway. Mm. People throwing stones and you stepping in the middle of it and like, really? Y'all going to throw stones at this sister? Like you have never done anything wrong? Let another person throw a stone. Whoever has not seen it. Right. Then went into the the uh the um temple and seen how they was robbing people, flipping and, and flipping money, and he flipped them tables over like, oh hell no! The <laughs> Lord, scheming and scamming people. What the hell is this? I wish y'all would oh. know who Jesus really was. Yeah. That's how I see him. I mind. love it. I love it. I know people probably could, well, you know, the Christian people <laughs> probably be like, what is they talking about? We talking real life Jesus today, yesterday, because he never changes. That's what we talk about. We have gone over time. This has been such a joy. Kia, you know I love you to life. You my baby girl and you be kicking such knowledge. I love it. We got to get that next uh, film going, Kia. You, you got to do the film. You got to. And that would be a perfect title for the next film. Jesus Somebody Today. help me make that film come to life. Like just... Jesus the Thug. How about that I mean, title? No, I don't want to call him a thug, mommy, though. I don't, he What's wrong, wrong with a thug? No. What's wrong with a little swag? What's wrong with it? Hey, it's you, about how yeah. we interpret it and what's in our hearts. Well, they said thug is the hate you give. Was it Hello. thug life? What's the, I don't know the whole acronym, but you know. What I mean. We'll get it together because we're going to do that movie. All right. This has been a joy. This is your girl, Sister Talk with Valerie, your chocolate smoothie, and my beautiful and intelligent and always kicking knowledge daughter, Miss Kia. Y'all, we love you. I don't even have music for y'all tonight because we're about six minutes over, but I love you. Six minutes? Six minutes. <laughs> <laughs>